Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming to another uh, session of OnePass uh, on our thematic series uh, on um, the mathematics of thin films. Uh, today we're very pleased to have uh, Maria Joanna Mora from the University of Pavia. And uh, as you can see, she'll be talking about the energy of a Mobius map. Maria Joanna. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the, the organizers for uh, this opportunity. And so what I'm going to um, talk about is based on a joint project with uh, Lorenzo Freddi from Udine, Peter Ornung from Dresden, and uh, uh, Roberto Baroni from, uh, from Pisa. Okay, so the motivation uh, for this work uh, um, comes, well, is the understanding of the mechanical properties of uh, Möbius strips. Well, Möbius strip is, well, probably the simplest example of a not orientable surface. And, uh, well, by the way, I found out that uh, the Möbius strip was discovered independently by Möbius and by another German mathematician's uh, listing. But for some reason, all the credit went to Möbius. So I decided to, to <laughs> quote listing in my first slide, just to be, to be fair. And well, the Möbius strip is a fascinating object, but um, actually there is a large interest in uh, the mechanical properties of, of Möbius strips, um, because, uh, well, Möbius strips arise in, uh, in many applications in different fields, such as in engineering and chemistry, for instance, and uh, so in these pictures uh, here, I somehow try to, uh, well, I would like to try to convince you that uh, this is in fact the, the case. So the first picture is uh, if you want uh, an application of maybe strip in engineering. So here you can see some uh, pulley belts and uh, the second one, so this one, in this one, the belt is in the shape of a Möbius strip. And this is done uh, so that you wear both sides uh, equally. So this is our first application if you want. And the other uh, pictures are at, much, at a much smaller scale. So this one uh, comes from a paper in, in Nature. And so what is this? Um, this is a, a ribbon shaped uh, um, crystals made of some, uh, of some uh, elements. And uh, so because of some uh, bending and twisting properties of, this, uh, of these elements, this uh, crystal takes uh, this form of a Möbius strip. So it may be interesting to understand how this, um, this object behaves mechanically. And uh, the last picture is about, uh, is about DNA nanotechnology. So I don't know if you can see them because they are pretty small. But th those small uh, things are actually small Möbius strips. So these are artificially produced uh, Möbius strips made of uh, uh, DNA segments. So there is a um, research field which is about uh, um, artificially producing, uh, reproducing uh, uh, shapes that are uh, common in nature by using uh, DNA segments. And so this is a case where they are able to reproduce the Möbius strips using DNA. So it's quite uh, fascinating. So this is just to uh, tell you that uh, the, in the interest in, uh, in the mechanical properties of Möbius strips is not just out of curiosity, but there are really applications, I mean, in the, in the real world, let's say. So um, the motivation, I mean, the, the starting point of our work um, comes from uh, um, a, a paper by Sadowski in 1930. So in this paper, one of the uh, goals of Sadowski uh, was to um, characterize, to find the ground state for um, an unstretchable Möbius strip. So sorry, I see there is a message in the chat. I don't know if... Uh, no, that wasn't for me. Okay. <laughs> so let's imagine to have uh, um, a Möbius strip made of some uh, unstretchable material. So for instance, a Möbius strip made of paper, and then uh, assume that there are no forces acting on the Möbius strip. So you just want to, to understand what is the shape uh, attained by a freestanding Möbius strip. And what you can observe in experiments is that if uh, the, the material is stiff enough so that you can ignore gravity, 
Then uh, there is a sort of universal shape uh, that uh, the Möbius strip adopts. So a universal shape uh, that is basically invariant of the material uh, the strip is made of. And so Sadowski uh, wanted somehow to uh, find this universal shape of a uh, Möbius strip made of an unstretchable material. And he formulated the problem in a variational way. So before entering into the details of this formulation, let me uh, say that, uh, well, the interest of Sadowski was in Möbius strips, but actually what I'm going to say um, play, um, applies to uh, any strip made of an unstretchable material. So the fact that the Möbius strip is not orientable uh, will not play any role in, uh, in, what I'm going to, um, in what I'm going to say. So this applies to any strip made of uh, an unstretchable material. So uh, Sadowski formulation is, is the following. So we start from uh, a planar strip. So for instance, made of paper. So this is, uh, this is unstretchable. And you consider the formations of this strip in, uh, in the space. So this is deformed, this strip is deformed into a surface in R3 but uh, uh, stretching is not allowed. So the admissible deformations are isometries. So in other words, U satisfies this differential and nonlinear constraint. And uh, the energy associated to uh, the formation of this kind is uh, the bending energy. So uh, it's, uh, some of the energy um, purely depends on bending. So in other words, on the curvature that you produce on, on the strip. So in the easiest case, you can uh, think of the bending energy as the L2 norm squared of the second fundamental form of U, of the curvature tensor of U. And uh, you can compute this uh, in this way. So this is the second derivatives of U dot the normal. And the normal is just the vector product of the two derivatives of u because u is an isometry. Okay, so this is the energy. And uh, uh, Sadowski says, uh, well, the, the, the equilibrium configurations of the strip uh, should be the minimizers of uh, uh, this bending energy uh, under the isometry constraint. So of course, if you just minimize the bending energy as it is, uh, well, <laughs> the minimum will be zero. So here I mean that you uh, also consider appropriate boundary conditions. So you minimize over all isometries satisfying certain boundary conditions. So for, the, for instance, those producing a Möbius strip, or you could also add external forces. And so in this case, in the energy, you will have an additional term accounting for the work done by the external forces. And uh, uh, just to make some uh, connection uh, with what we have seen in the previous uh, lectures of this uh, series of talks. So this energy um, is uh, uh, the Kirchhoff energy, the Kirchhoff plate energy uh, in the isotropic case, because in general here, you could have a more general quadratic uh, form uh, computed at the curvature tensor. Uh, so this is the isotropic Kirchhoff energy. So this is a well-known uh, model for, for plates, well-known in mechanics. And it is one of the models uh, that you can deduce uh, rigorously uh, from three-dimensional and nonlinear elasticity by gamma convergence. So this is the famous result by Frisek, James, and Müller. This was uh, discussed by Gilles in his talk uh, a few weeks ago. Okay, so now... Um, if you want now to, uh, well, identify the minimizers of this energy, uh, well, this is a quite a difficult task because, well, already uh, writing down the Euler-Lagrange equations is very difficult because you have to deal with the isometry constraint. So it's not clear how to perform variations for, for this problem. And so uh, Sadowski uh, tried to um, simplify the problem by looking at a very narrow strip. So now the strip has a, a small height, h, so h is small with respect to the, to the length. And at the end of, the, at the very end of the paper, Sadowski says, uh, well, if uh, the strip is uh, narrow enough, so uh, for h small enough, then Kirchhoff energy reduces to this one dimensional uh, functional. So this is a functional defined on the midline of the strip, which is the interval 0L. 
So the midline is uh, deformed into a curve in the space, a curve of the same length, because we are looking at isometric deformations. And uh, along this curve, uh, you can consider curvature and torsion, and the energy is going to depend on uh, well, this expression of the curvature and of the torsion. So this is what Sadowski says, but uh, well, he doesn't say how he gets this energy. So he doesn't say a word about the derivation of this energy from Kirchhoff, so it's quite uh, mysterious. And, um, and also, well, we can notice that uh, this energy, this one dimensional energy is not, not well defined uh, at points where the curvature is equal to zero. Well, first of all, because we are dividing by the curvature, but also uh, to speak of a curvature and torsion along a curve, uh, we need the Frenet frame to be defined. And the Frenet frame is defined when the curvature is different from zero. And so it's not clear how to, uh, in, how to interpret this energy at points where the curvature is equal to zero. So uh, after Sadowski's paper, there were several attempts to um, understand how to uh, deduce uh, this functional, which is now known as the Sadowski functional, from uh, uh, Kirchhoff energy. And uh, uh, well, um, a first uh, attempt that I would like to mention is due to uh, Wunderlich. So uh, what do Wunderlich does is uh, to compute the pointwise limit of the Kirchhoff energy as uh, h, as the height, tends to zero. And so he shows that the Sadowski functional is uh, the pointwise limit uh, of Kirchhoff energy as h tends to zero. Uh, but this is done, uh, again, for uh, uh, curvature different from zero. And uh, uh, because the, the strategy is, uh, is the following, so uh, you start uh, from a flat strip. This is uh, deformed isometrically into a surface. So the deformed surface must be a developable surface along which the curve, the midline, is a geodetic. And so the deformed surface can be described as the so-called rectifying developable of Y, which is the, the, the surface generated, so it's the envelope of the tangent planes to the curve. So in other words, for the deformed surface, you have uh, this parametrization, which involves, uh, for instance, the binormal to the curve, the torsion and the curvature. So you have this parametrization when the curvature is different from zero for the deformed surface. You can use this parametrization to compute uh, the second fundamental form. You use uh, this expression into the Kirchhoff energy, you integrate over the height, and then you send h to zero. So this is what Wunderlich does. So he needs the curvature to be different from zero. So uh, he doesn't uh, consider the case where the curvature may be um, equal to zero. But uh, uh, what is more important to, to stress is that what he computes is a pointwise limit. So if our goal is to understand how minimizers of the Kirchhoff energy behave as h tends to zero, uh, the pointwise limit is, is not the right limit to take. We should take the limit in the sense of gamma convergence, so not in the sense, not, not the pointwise limit. And so an attempt in this direction was done by Kirby and Fried. So they compute the gamma limit uh, of Kirchhoff energy on a thin strip, but again, they assume the curvature to be bounded away from zero. So they do not take into account the case where the curvature may be equal to zero. And moreover, the gamma limit is computed in uh, the weak W3P uh, topology. And this is not uh, satisfactory. So this is not good <laughs> because, uh, well, if we want to apply the fundamental theorem of gamma convergence, so if you want to uh, conclude that minimizers go to minimizer, gamma convergence is not enough. Uh, you need also compactness, compactness of minimizing sequences. So the gamma limit must be computed with respect to a topology in which you have uh, compactness of minimizing sequences. And the point is that you will never get compactness in this topology for minimizing sequences. Why is that? Well, what kind of compactness can we expect on minimizing sequences? Well, typically, uh, the kind of uh, information we have is abound on the energy. 
And in our case, the energy is the Kirchhoff energy. So it's uh, this one. So having this energy bounded on a sequence means that we have a bound in L2 for these objects. So a bound on the second derivatives of U. So the, the bound we can expect on minimizing sequences is an L2 bound for second derivatives. So the best compactness we can hope for is weak in W22. So we will never get a bound in, um, so a bound for uh, third derivatives in order to, to get such a topology. So this topology is not the right one uh, in which computes the gamma limit. And so the question uh, remained open of, uh, well, whether the Sadovsky functional can be deduced as a gamma limit of the Kirchhoff energy in a natural topology. So by a natural topology, I mean a topology with respect to which minimizing sequences are compact. And the second question is what happens at points where the curvature is equal to zero. So how do we need to interpret this energy when the curvature is equal to zero? And so we, uh, well, we gave an answer to this question in uh, uh, these two uh, papers. So actually uh, what I'm going to talk about in, uh, in this talk is uh, so basically corresponds to the first paper, the one in the Journal of Elasticity. So somehow my idea is to try to keep uh, uh, things as easy as possible. <laughs> and so I'll uh, try to discuss uh, somehow the easiest case, which is the one contained in the Journal of Elasticity. And then maybe at the end of the talk, uh, I'll try to say you something more. So for instance, something about what we did in the Cyan paper. Of course, if you want to know more, so if you want to know more details, uh, just uh, let me know, just uh, ask me. Okay. So uh, mathematically, uh, this is the uh, problem that we uh, have. So we have uh, um, a strip of small height, H. This is the energy. So this is the Kirchhoff energy. So actually here I scaled by a unit height. Otherwise uh, the limit is just zero. And this is defined on isometries. So W22, this is the natural regularity because we have an L2 bound on second derivatives. I mean, uh, having energy, having finite energy means uh, having second derivatives in L2. And AU is uh, the second fundamental form of U. Okay, so uh, in order to uh, understand the gamma limit, to compute the gamma limit of this energy as H tends to zero, well, the first step to do, we have already seen this in Irene's talk and in Gilles' talk, the first step to do is, to, is um, a, a scaling in such a way to uh, be on a set independent of H. And so we uh, define a strip of height one and we scale the formation in this way. And so we scale by H the, the X2 variable. And so from now on, I'm going to refer to this uh, scale deformation Y. So this is not uh, an isometry anymore because of the scaling. So let's say that uh, let's call it a scaled isometry in the sense that these constraints are satisfied. And uh, we can also uh, write the second fundamental form in terms of Y. And this is what we uh, obtain. So uh, this is the normal vector written in terms of Y. And, uh, and this is the, the scaled uh, curvature tensor. So basically, every time you have a derivative with respect to x2, you get uh, um, a factor 1 over h in front. So here you have two derivatives in x2, and so a factor 1 over h squared in front. OK, now you uh, perform the change of variable in the energy. And so this is the energy we are going to, uh, to study. So the L2 norm squared of the scaled curvature tensor. And here, there is a very important remark. So this is going to play a key role in, uh, in the following, a crucial role. So uh, U is an isometry. So we know by uh, Gauss theorem that isometries preserve uh, the Gauss curvature. So we start with a flat uh, strip and then U is an isometry. So the deformed surface will have uh, uh, Gauss curvature equal to zero. So what is the Gauss curvature is the determinant of the second fundamental form. So the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero. And the same is true for the scale curvature tensor, because 
uh, these two matrices are, are the same. So it's just, this is just uh, this matrix written in terms of Y. So in other words, our energy uh, here is the L2 norm squared of a matrix with zero determinant. And then actually this matrix is given by this expression here. So it's in terms of second derivatives. Okay, so this is the structure. And now the, the first result that we proved is uh, about compactness. So uh, the question is what kind of uh, uh, convergence, what kind of compactness uh, can we get uh, on a sequence of scaled isometries with uh, equibounded energies and what kind of properties we have on the limit. So this is also to, to understand what is the right topology that we should use to compute the gamma limit. So we start from a sequence of scaled isometries in W22 with bounded energies and then uh, this is the compactness result. So maybe, okay, here it is. Okay, so first of all, as we were expecting, the uh, deformations turns out to be compact weakly in W22. So the limit Y um, is a W22 function, but it's, it's a function only of the X1 variable. So Y is going to be the deformation of the midline and it's W22. Then in the limit, we also find other objects. So these are called directors, D1, D2, and D3. These are functions of the X1 variable, so along the, the midline of the strip, and they are uh, such that to form um, a rotation matrix. So these are unit length vectors, and they are orthogonal to each other. So what are they? Well, D1 is just the limit of the derivative in X1. So if you want, D1 is just the derivative of the limit in the formation. Uh, D2 is uh, the weak limit of the derivative in X2, but it's uh, scaled by, by H. And uh, D3, it's not written in, in the slide, it's actually the limit of the normal vector. So at the, at the limit, we have these three orthonormal directors, and one of them, the first one, is just the derivative of the deformation of the midline. So this is the compactness we have. And uh, moreover, the scaled uh, curvature tensor, well, this is bounded in L2, so it's going to have uh, a limit in L2, a weak limit, so of course this is uh, up to the subsequences. So this is going to have uh, um, a weak limit in L2, and uh, uh, some entries, those ones can be identified in terms of these limiting objects, except for this entry, which is the one depending somehow on higher scalings of the derivatives. For this component, we can just say that this is a function in L2. So it's not uh, maybe independent from the directors. And we get also an extra constraint on the directors. Okay, so I understand that here there's a lot of information. So let me try to explain better what is the meaning of all these things that we have found as, as limit, as a, as a result of compactness. Well, first of all, why? So the, the limiting deformation, I, I said that it's the deformation of the midline and its derivative is D1, which is a unit vector. So what I'm saying is that the, the midline is going to be inextensible. And okay, this is not surprising because we are looking at, limiting, at uh, limits of uh, isometries. Okay. And then we have those directors, D1, D2, and D3. So they form a frame, like an orthonormal frame along the curve. Actually, D1 um, is, uh, since it's uh, the derivative of Y and its unit length, D1 is the tangent vector to the curve. So the first vector in this frame is the tangent vector. And then we have these other two directors which uh, uh, lie in the normal plane to the curve. They are unit lengths and they are orthogonal. In particular, D2, uh, if you remember, is the limit of the derivative in X2, of the scale derivative in X2. So it represents uh, the transversal orientation of the strip, while D3 represents the normal direction to the strip. So what about the constraint that we found from compactness? Well, this quantity can be interpreted as the geodesic curvature of the midline because, well, D1 is the, the tangent vector. So if you take the derivative of D1, 
this gives you the, the normal, the normal vector to the curve. So what I'm saying is that the normal, the normal vector to the curve is orthogonal to D2. And so it must be parallel to D3, which is the normal to the surface. So what I'm saying is that the normal to the midline is parallel to the normal to the surface. So in other words, the curvature of the midline is all along the normal vector to the surface. There, there is no geodesic curvature. So me in mechanical terms, this means that the strip cannot bend within its plane. So bending is allowed only in the normal direction to the strip. And well, this is again um, a consequence of the isometry constraint. So here I try to explain this with some pictures. So I have to say that those pictures are taken from a paper of mine about 3D objects. So here, these are not strips, there is a thickness. So sorry for that. <laughs> sorry if the picture doesn't really match <laughs> with, with what I'm saying. So let's forget about the thickness. This should be um, strips, like two dimensional objects. But uh, so somehow the idea is that uh, the, the point is that uh, the, the strip can be bent. Uh, so the, the midline can be bent in the direction of the normal to the surface, but not uh, in, in the plane of the strip. So this kind of, uh, of behavior is not allowed. So this would violate the isometry constraint. OK, so uh, this uh, uh, moving frame of directors uh, um, reminds us of the Frenet frame. And in fact, when the Frenet frame exists, so when the curvature is different from zero, then these directors can be related to the Frenet frame. So D1 is just the tangent vector. Uh, D2, uh, since we have seen that it's orthogonal to uh, the derivative of the tangent vector, must be parallel to the binormal. And D3, uh, which was the normal to the surface, is, uh, is parallel and also to the curve, is parallel to the, to the normal. But the point is that we don't know, we, we don't need uh, a Frenet frame to uh, exist. And uh, this is somehow the interesting aspect, aspect of this uh, compactness result. So what we get in the limit, the limiting objects that we get are not simply curves, but are curves uh, with a frame, with a moving frame. And uh, the existence of this frame allows us to uh, give a notion of curvature and torsion even when the frame frame does not exist, and so curvature and torsion are not classically defined. And the point is that we are not imposing or prescribing the existence of this frame. The existence of the frame comes out from compactness, from the bound on the energy. So more precisely, uh, well, if you look uh, at those relations, uh, is, uh, is quite clear. Uh, we can interpret this uh, as the curvature and this as the torsion. So um, since we have the existence of this frame, we can get, give a meaning to the curvature and to the torsion, even at points where these are not classically defined. And those quantities, so this notion of curvature and torsions, are exactly the entries that we, that we have in uh, the limiting uh, matrix, in the limiting second fundamental forms. So the, the limit of the second fundamental forms involve the curvature and the torsion. And then there is, additional, uh, there is uh, this additional function gamma that cannot be identified in general in terms of the director. So this is what we get from, uh, from compactness. OK, so what about uh, the determinant equal to zero constraint? So the, the scale curvature tensors satisfy determinant equal to zero, but then we pass to the limit in the weak sense. So this constraint, determinant equal to zero, may be lost when we pass to the limit. So in general, this limiting matrix may have a determinant different from zero. OK, so this is the compactness. And now what about the gamma limit? Well. This compactness result immediately gives us a lower bound for the energy just by lower semi-continuity. So those matrices are converging weakly to this. And so just by weak lower semi-continuity, we can give this lower bound for the energies. And here, well, gamma is not uh, identified in terms of the directors. So we could simply minimize over gamma. So we just, uh, in this case, uh, well, uh, the, the minimum, uh, uh, the minimizer is just gamma equal to zero. So we could just throw it away 
and we get something smaller. So is this uh, um, a good lower bound? So is it uh, optimal? So can we attain this, uh, this lower bound on a sequence of scaled isometries? Or is uh, this lower bound uh, too, uh, too low? So I see there is a question. Why do you have that the limit of products is, um, is the product of limits in, uh, so you, you are saying, so uh, see there is a question of Gilles. So your question is, uh, let me go back. So why I can say, for instance, that this is the, the, weak, uh, uh, the weak limit. Is this the question? So why can I, why can I characterize the weak limit in this way? Well, I have uh, um, compactness enough to say this because uh, um, so this is the derivative in X1 of this object, which is converging weakly in W12. So it's the- Yes, sorry, I, I, I had a hard time unmuting. And, uh, and the normal vector is going strongly. So I can pass to the limit in those products. I have enough compactness to do so. I hope that I convinced you. <laughs> okay. So I was talking about the, the lower bound. So let me go back here. Okay, so the question is, uh, is this lower bound uh, good enough or is it too low? So in other words, can I found a sequence of scaled isometries on which I attain uh, this lower bound or, or not? Well, if I want to, um, to attain this, this bound, so it means that I want to construct a sequence of scaled isometries on which uh, uh, the limit of these quantities uh, equals this quantity here, let's say with gamma equal to zero. So uh, this is basically the convergence of the, of the L2 norms, but we also have weak convergence. So we are saying that we must have a strong convergence. So strong convergence of those matrices to this matrix. But these matrices have zero determinant. And now if we have a strong convergence, then the strong limit, we need to have uh, zero determinant as well. And this is not the case. So in other words, this bound cannot be attained. So it's, uh, it's too low. And so in order to understand what a good uh, lower bound uh, could be, um, what we, we need to do uh, is uh, uh, the following. So somehow we need to, to understand how to, uh, to deal uh, with this uh, determinant equal to zero constraint under weak convergence. And in order to do that, uh, it is convenient to look uh, at this, uh, uh, at this uh, um, problem. And, uh, um, okay, so I, I saw that, uh, well, Gilles lost the connection while I was answering, so maybe I can uh, give you my answer later on if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, sorry, the chat is very distracting, so. I'll, uh, I'll try not, not to look at it and maybe I'll answer at the end. And um, okay, so um, what I was saying is that it's, it's convenient to look at this simpler problem. So here we forget for a while about second fundamental forms and we consider this, uh, this energy, uh, which is defined on L2 matrices and it's given by the L2 norm squared on matrices with zero determinant and it's plus infinity otherwise. Okay, so this energy uh, is not lower semi-continuous um, with respect to weak convergence in L2 because uh, um, you can approximate a, uh, a matrix with non-zero determinant by a sequence of matrices with zero determinant. You can do this approximation weakly in L2. So more precisely, actually, any matrix, whatever its determinant is, can be obtained as weak limit in L2 of matrices with zero determinant. And this is not difficult to, to see. And so this makes the energy not lower semi-continuous in particular. So this is not difficult to see. And uh, so here uh, you can see an example. So let's look uh, at a constant and diagonal matrix. So here mu1 and mu2 are two constants not zero, so that the determinant of this matrix is different from zero. And now this matrix can be approximated weakly in L2 by these matrices Mn. 
So here, what we are doing is the usual construction a la Riemann-Lebeg, so the usual construction of a sequence converging weakly but not strongly. So we consider a parameter lambda in 0, 1, and we consider the characteristic function of the interval 0 lambda, and then we extend this function by periodicity outside 0, 1. And then we perform this scaling, so n is going to infinity, so in such a way to make this characteristic function widely oscillating between 0 and 1. And uh, so in this way, you produce a sequence that converges weakly to lambda, but not strongly. And so those uh, matrices are converging weakly to our uh, starting matrix, but those matrices have zero determinant because, uh, uh, well, at any point x, one of these two functions is equal to zero. So because chi takes only values one and zero. So one of these two entries is always equal to zero. So mn has zero determinant and it converges weakly to something that doesn't have a determinant equal to zero. Okay, so this is the basic example. And then you can reproduce this uh, for any arbitrary uh, matrix essentially. Okay, so from this example, we have understood that uh, we can approximate any matrix. So whatever its determinant is by a sequence of zero determinant matrices. We can do that in a weak convergence of L2. But now the question is, well, you can do this approximation very well, but uh, how much energy are you going to spend by performing this approximation? And by energy, I mean the functional F. So in other words, when you perform this approximation, what is the minimal energy in terms of F that you need to spend to perform this approximation? So this corresponds to uh, characterizing, to characterize the so-called lower semi-continuous envelope of F, which is, uh, by the way, just the gamma limit of F with respect to weak convergence. And this is what we computed. And so what you can see is that, uh, well, the energy, the minimal energy you have to spend depends on the determinant of the matrix. <laughs> well, this is not surprising, but we have uh, an exact, uh, um, an exact uh, computation of uh, the, the dependence on the determinant. So the minimal energy uh, is given by the L2 norm squared of M plus twice the modulus of the determinant. So this is the minimal energy that you spend when you perform this approximation by zero determinant matrices. So this, uh, uh, this is called a relaxation result because this functional, the lower semi-continuous envelope is also called the relaxed functional of F. Uh, this theorem can be proved uh, in a much more general setting. So uh, here you could have uh, um, a coercive uh, quadratic form and uh, also the determinant equal to zero constraint could be replaced by determinant equal to a given function. And you can uh, characterize, you can compute the, the, the relaxed functional. But now uh, going back to our initial problem, so uh, understanding the gamma limit of the Kirchhoff energy, this relaxation result suggests uh, uh, what the, the density for our problem should be. Uh, because, so if you remember, we are dealing with uh, uh, the sequence of scaled curvature tensors. Uh, so these are matrices with zero determinant and they are converging weakly. So we expect that uh, somehow this process uh, should, uh, should occur. And so at the end, we should see this uh, uh, function uh, appear. And uh, so in our case, uh, M will be, so the limiting uh, curvature tensor, where if you remember these entries, which are denoted by alpha and beta here, are those uh, related to curvature and, and torsion while uh, this entry gamma is the one that we cannot identify in terms of the directors. So uh, the, the, the idea is to well look uh, at this function that we should generate because of this uh, determinant equal to zero constraint and just minimize over this entry gamma. And so this provides us with a function of two, um, of two variables, alpha and beta. And, uh, and now the, somehow the, the guess for, gamma, for the gamma limit is uh, this one dimensional functional where we have uh, this limiting density, which is defined here. 
in terms of the curvature and of the torsion and you integrate on X1. So here, just for simplicity, I'm considering the gamma limit as a function of the directors, uh, which must satisfy, well, they must form an orthonormal frame and they must satisfy the geodesic curvature uh, tensor, the geodesic curvature equal to zero condition. Okay, so this is the guess for the gamma limit. And in fact, you can prove that this is the gamma limit. So this is the, the main theorem about gamma convergence. So if we start from a general sequence of scale isometries uh, converging in the sense given by compactness, then we can bound uh, the energies in terms of the functional that I have just defined. And conversely, the bound, this lower bound is optimal. So if you start by, uh, if you start with, um, with an admissible frame, you can construct a sequence of scale isometries on which uh, the, the lower bound is, is attained. Okay, so here, uh, well, I, I wouldn't like to, to go into the details of the proof. Of course, if you want to know more, I will be more than happy uh, to, to tell you more. Um, let me just say that uh, the um, limit inequality, so uh, this part of the, of the theorem, it's, um, it's easy to prove once you have the, the relaxation result. What is less uh, easy is uh, the second part, so the construction of, the, of those scale isometries, so the so-called construction of, uh, of the recovery sequence. And uh, so somehow here, the difficulty comes from the fact that uh, in the relaxation result, we worked with the arbitrary matrices. So we forgot about the, the structure of being a set of fundamental forms. While here, well, we need to, th those matrices must be uh, second fundamental forms of uh, uh, scaled isometries. So in other words, from the relaxation result, we have a recovery sequence made of zero determinant matrices. But then we need, we need a construction, so we need um, a, a tool to construct an isometry satisfying a, a set of constraints as, for instance, having a prescribed second fundamental form on the midline of the strip. So this is the difficult part. We need to combine the relaxation result with the construction of uh, isometries satisfying a certain set of conditions. And so this is what makes the proof not, the proof not, uh, not trivial. Okay, but now what I would like to discuss is the relation of the gamma limit that we found with the Sadowski energy. Okay, so we computed the gamma limit in a natural topology. So uh, how is this related to uh, the Sadowski energy? So uh, the Sadowski energy is uh, well defined when the curvature is different from zero. So assume this is the case. And then we have seen before that our frame can be related to the Frenet frame, which exists now because the curvature is not zero. And using this relation, you can see that what we call the, the curvature is actually uh, coincides up to the sign to the curvature in the classical sense. And what we call the torsion is uh, the torsion coincides with the torsion in the classical sense. So here we have a functional of curvature and torsion. And what about the energy density? Well, this was defined through this uh, pointwise uh, minimum problem that we can solve explicitly. And when we solve it, uh, this is the expression that we find. Uh, so uh, here you uh, can uh, maybe <laughs> recognize the Sadowski energy density. Uh, but this is the this coincides with our energy density only in this regime. So if the curvature is above the torsion, otherwise uh, you need to correct the energy density in this way. And this is exactly the case when the curvature is equal to zero. So when the curvature is equal to zero, the right definition, so the, the right density energy is given by this expression and not by the Sadowski one. So we can conclude that the Sadowski functional gives a correct description only when the curvature is big enough, actually larger than the torsion. Otherwise, uh, the correct description of minimizers involves uh, a functional with a different density, this, uh, this one. Okay, so now 
in uh, the time uh, left, I would like to uh, mention some uh, related results uh, and uh, open questions. And so in what we have seen so far, uh, well, we started from uh, a two-dimensional model, uh, Kirchhoff theory, and we deduced a one-dimensional model, so Sadowski with, uh, with some uh, correction. So uh, one could argue that, uh, well, the Kirchhoff model is just one of the many uh, play theories that you can find in the literature. So why starting from Sadowski, uh, sorry, why starting from Kirchhoff and not from another plate model? Or um, another question uh, could be, uh, well, uh, we model the strip as a two-dimensional set, but in reality, uh, the strip, I mean, the, the, for instance, the strip of paper will have some thickness, maybe very small, but uh, it will be, a, it's a three-dimensional object clearly. And so maybe we should model it as a three-dimensional object using the um, three-dimensional theory of nonlinear elasticity. And so this is related to, um, to, the, to what are called three-dimensional ribbons. So let me say just a few words about this. So uh, let us consider a three-dimensional set of, uh, of this form. So we have three parameters, the length, L, the width, H, and the thickness, delta. And uh, let us consider any deformation of this set and the nonlinear elastic energy, three-dimensional nonlinear elastic energy, where W uh, satisfies the usual uh, assumptions that we have seen, uh, for instance, in Gilles' talk. So these are the assumptions, for instance, used by Frisek, James, and Müller to deduce their hierarchy of models. Okay, so if uh, um, H, so the width and the length are of order one, and you assume the thickness to be very small, to be, uh, so to go to zero, then you are modeling a so-called membrane or plate. And so then if you consider different scalings of the energy, you deduce different models. So membrane is the ledre route result. For highest, higher scalings, you have the results by Friesdeke, James, and Müller. So this was discussed in the first two lectures of this uh, thematic series. If instead you consider the length of order one and the thickness and width to, be, to go to zero with the same order, then you are modeling a so-called beam or rod and here you can also um, deduce a hierarchy of models. So this was done for the regime corresponding to the ledre out case. So this was done by Acerbi Buttazzo Percivale, while the higher scalings were done by uh, Stefan Müller and myself many years ago, almost 20 years ago, <laughs> so some time ago. What, I'm one, what I want to consider here is uh, the case of uh, so-called ribbons, which means that both, both delta and H, so both the thickness and the width are uh, going to zero, but at a different speed. And so those objects are very much studied in the physics and engineering literature because they are very common in the real world. And so this seems to be the right setting to study our, uh, I mean, our problem related to the, to the Sadowski functional. Because, uh, well, what we did was to start from 2D Kirchhoff, which is the limit of 3D elasticity when the thickness tends to zero. And then in, in the Kirchhoff energy, we sent the, width, the, the, the height to zero to get a one-dimensional model. So, we are taking two gamma limits uh, at different times, so sequentially. And so this should correspond somehow to having two parameters where one goes to zero uh, faster than the other. So these are very interesting structures because, uh, well, their behavior is somehow intermediate between uh, beams and plates. And, uh, and, and because, well, you have two different scales and so more interesting uh, uh, phenomena may, may happen. So also for ribbons, you can try to deduce a hierarchy of models. So I'm going to say something about this at the very end of the talk, but now let me discuss about the Sadowski functional. So now assume to have a ribbon. So uh, the thickness, which depends on H is very small. Actually, it's much smaller than the width H, which is also small. And this is the three-dimensional energy scaled by unit uh, area. So the question is, can we derive the Sadowski functional in its corrected form from this energy? 
Well, first of all, we can consider different scalings of this energy. So what is the right scaling that should provide us with Sadowski? Well, uh, the right scaling uh, turns out to be one over delta squared. Okay, why is that? Well, it comes out from computations, but <laughs> if you want, uh, we have seen that Kirchhoff, uh, Kirchhoff energy uh, corresponds to scaling the 3D energy by uh, one over the thickness square. And here it's the same, uh, the same thing. So it's the thickness squared. So let us look at this scaling of the energy. Can we uh, deduce the Sadowski functional as the gamma limit of this energy when delta and H uh, go to zero? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on how fast delta goes to zero with respect to H. More precisely, we have the following results. So if delta is uh, uh, much larger than H squared, so delta is in between H squared and H, so in other words, delta is small, but actually not so small, then the gamma limit does not uh, uh, give you Sadowski actually gives you um, a quadratic uh, energy on uh, curvature and torsion. So the limiting class is the same as in the Sadowski functional. So you have this moving frame satisfying the geodesic curvature constraint, but the energy is uh, quadratic in the curvature and in torsion. So it's not the Sadowski functional. If uh, uh, instead delta is uh, much smaller than H squared, so here delta is pretty small, then we expect that the gamma limit should provide us with the Sadowski functional in its corrected form. So unfortunately, this, this result is not complete yet. So actually it has been a work in progress for a while. We are almost there. So I hope that at some point we will have a complete proof. So we expect that this should provide the Sadowski functional. And here the difficulty is uh, uh, in the proof of the, uh, of the gamma limit inequality. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it should be clear from what I told you that to get Sadowski, uh, well, the, the determinant equal to zero constraint must, uh, must appear some, at some point. And when you start uh, with the, the Kirchhoff energy, you start with isometries. So uh, the determinant equal to zero constraint is uh, uh, exactly satisfied. Now you are starting um, from three-dimensional deformations. And so you only know that those deformations are close to isometries, but they are not exactly isometries. And so the determinant equal to zero constraint uh, is not going to be satisfied exactly along the sequence. So is satisfied only in an approximate sense. And this is the difficulty. So you need somehow to extract this piece of information that the determinant is almost zero from your sequence. And uh, so this is crucial if you want to obtain Sadowski. So this is what we expect. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have a complete proof yet. And then, of course, uh, there is uh, the a critical case where delta is exactly of the order h squared. And here, actually, we don't know what the gamma limit should be. So my uh, personal opinion, which could be wrong, <laughs> is that in this case, uh, we should get, so what I, what I expect is that here, we should get uh, something new, so a new, a new model, uh, a, a one-dimensional model, but a, a new one. And uh, uh, so somehow I expect a dependence on, on the determinant. So I expect that uh, the determinant equal to zero constraint can be violated, but somehow the energy will take into account how much you are far from satisfying this constraint. So I expect a dependence on, on this, whatever it means, because it's very vague, <laughs> okay. And um, okay, and now I, if I have time, just a few minutes, uh, do I have some more time? Just, okay. Um, I just would like to, to mention some related results and open questions. So about the 2D to 1D case, uh, I told you that uh, one can prove uh, something more, more general. Uh, so for instance, you can consider a, a general quadratic form and not just the, the modulus squared. You can start from a strip, which is uh, flat, but not, not necessarily straight. And you can also add uh, like a prescribed target uh, tensor. So this is like uh, 
uh, included in, uh, in the problem a sort of um, pre-strain. So there is a sort of uh, target uh, uh, tensor that uh, it's, it's what you would like to, to reach as, uh, as curvature for your, for, your, for your strip. And so you can, uh, so this is basically, this, this was done by Agostiniani, Vestimoni and Kumatos in some settings. So it was for elastomers. And then this was uh, what we did in, um, in the Cyan paper. You can also uh, start uh, from other uh, two-dimensional plate models. So instead of Kirchhoff, you can start from other two-dimensional plate models. So this is something that we did in another paper in 2018. And uh, you observe a phenomenon similar to the one you see in the Sadowski case, in the Kirchhoff case, if you start from uh, constraint uh, von Karman's theory, which is one of the theories in the hierarchy by Friseke, James and Müller. And what we are currently uh, doing is, uh, uh, well, adding boundary conditions. So what I discussed so far is just about the bending energy. But of course, if you want to have uh, a non-trivial minimum problem, you should add boundary conditions. So we would like to see if uh, the gamma uh, convergence result is uh, stable under uh, the addition of uh, some uh, boundary conditions. So for, it, for instance, those corresponding to a Mebius strip. And moreover, well, the original motivation of Sadowski was to uh, find the natural shape of a, uh, of a Mebius strip. So at the end of the day, this question has not been answered yet. And so uh, something, um, uh, some, something that we are doing is to try to, well, now we have the gamma limit, maybe with boundary conditions. And then maybe we, we so it would be nice to, uh, to see if we can establish some, some properties for, for the minimizers. And so maybe it's not possible to identify the ground state of a Mebius strip, but maybe in this approximation with small height, we can establish some, some properties, I don't know, for the center line, for the number of twists or something else. So this is something that we would like to do. And finally, uh, about the ribbons, so 3D to 1D, I told you before about uh, deriving a hierarchy of models for, for ribbons. And uh, so what you can see is that the relevant scalings are in terms of delta, uh, which was uh, the thickness. So this is something that I did with uh, Lorenzo, Freddi, and Roberto Paroni. Uh, so we did this on, uh, for some scalings. So there are some, uh, some scalings that are still open. So one is alpha equal to two, which is the one that I've discussed in the previous slide. So the one which should uh, give uh, uh, Sadowski uh, if delta and H are in a suitable relation. And actually also the scalings alpha between two and four are open because there you should observe a phenomenon, a phenomenon similar to the one producing a Sadowski. So uh, when you start from 3D to 1D, you can deduce a hierarchy for some scalings, but the result is not uh, complete yet. Uh, these uh, results are about uh, uh, rectangular cross sections. So those results are about a rectangular cross section. You uh, could also uh, look at cross section of uh, arbitrary geometry. And this was done, but uh, in, for those scalings, so higher scalings, this was done by Elisa Davoli in her PhD thesis back in, uh, so it was part of her PhD thesis back in 2013. And uh, another very interesting, uh, um, uh, another in very interesting topic is about uh, non-Euclidean ribbons. So there is a huge literature in uh, physics and in engineering about uh, frustrated ribbons. So this is related to what Marta discussed, but uh, now this is for ribbons. And uh, so you have these two scales. And there is a very interesting recent paper. So this is a physics paper. So uh, it's not a gamma convergence result by Levin, Seifert, Sharon, and Maur. So this is very recent. It's not a gamma convergence result. So they do matching asymptotics, but they show that some very interesting phenomena may occur for ribbons according to how the two parameters go uh, to zero, one with respect to the other, and according to uh, the geometry that you have. So these are cases where you start from a ribbon, which is a, a small neighborhood of a surface with small width. So you start with a surface having 
its own metric and its own curvature. And then the energy uh, penalizes the distance of metric and curvature from a target reference metric and curvature. And so if the reference metric and curvature are not compatible, um, so there exists no surface having those reference tensors as metric and curvature, then there is going to be some frustration in, uh, in the ribbon. And so this produces many, many interesting configurations. The, so there's really, there's really a lot to be, to be understood and to be done also from a mathematical point of view, because this result is not, uh, um, so it's a physics paper basically. So there, it's, not, uh, it's not gamma convergence, it's just uh, uh, asymptotics, matching asymptotics. Okay, so I conclude here and I thank you for your attention. Very nice talk. Thanks a lot, Marie Uh We will open up uh, to questions. Uh, anybody or comments? Anybody have anything? Feel free. I would like to make a small comment. Uh, there is a 1744 paper by Leonard Euler, uh, which is called On Elastic Curves. And he considered exactly that problem in the regime tau equals zero. So it's plain, it's a two dimensional version. So Sadovsky mm -hmm. energy simply becomes uh, kappa squared. Okay. And he considered all of that, uh, all possible equilibrium shapes of elastic ribbons. So he called them elastic ribbons. So these are okay. two dimensional elastic ribbons. And he found all of the equilibrium shapes. He considered uh, then ribbons of variable thickness, and then he considered restrained ribbons. So he answered all of your questions in this two dimensional case. It's a 94 page addendum to his magnum opus on calculus of variations. <laughs> In the case uh, you said with uh, with no torsion, no torsion, just plain, yeah. So the, the curves are two dimensional curves. Okay. <laughs> so this is just a comment. It's not a question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, I have one, if I may. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, you okay? So I, I don't want to press too much on stuff that you know isn't out yet. But so you were saying that you want to enter, uh, you want to um, enforce the torus condition with with a boundary condition. Uh, so I guess you know one way to do this would be to say just the end of the ribbon and the the start of the ribbon get glued together, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, in some sense, would it not be more natural to impose a, a topological constraint rather than actual boundary conditions? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you may, you may be right, but uh, somehow for for this kind of problem, uh, I think it's more natural to add boundary conditions. And um, yeah, I mean, for this formulation, I think uh, this would be more natural. Okay, I, the the reason I asked this is I you know I was thinking okay, well, the natural question to ask is what happens if instead of a Mobius strip we have one with you know three twists or five yeah. twists or arbitrarily yeah, many. So yeah. in principle, uh, if I just impose a boundary condition saying that well have this uh, flip, then uh, I don't know how many uh, twists I'm I'm going to to have in uh, in the structure. So I'm not sure that it's going to be I mean a real Mobius strip as in in this picture. I see. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's true. So I don't know if there is a way to say that uh, at least for minimizers, it's convenient to have just one twist instead of uh, um, another number of twists. Um, so maybe this can be recovered as a property of minimizers. But uh, yeah, actually, I, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the, if I really want a Mobius strip, then I should. Uh, I should consider a topological constraint. That's right. Thanks. Other uh, Stephen. Yeah, if I could. Very nice talk, Maria. Uh, a couple of things. So this matched asymptotics remark you made at the end, that reminded me of some numerical work I'd seen on the Mobius strip in the thin, oh. in the, the small width limit, which basically showed a very natural concentration of the, the curvature. So essentially mm -hmm. no turning and then rapid turn. There was a sort of a threefold symmetry okay. in, in that simulation. So I, I guess, have, have you studied minimizers and numerically in any detail to? Um, no, so I, I, I think that, well, in this paper uh, where they do matching asymptotics, yeah. I think they also have experiments. Mm -hmm. 
because the, there are some very nice pictures, so very nice geometries and uh, so behavior of, of ribbons. So there may, there may be something in this paper. Yes. That I quoted, yeah, I just, but... checked, I just quickly checked that paper since you had the reference there. And, and okay. they do have basically these concentrated uh, okay. curvature conditions. So I, I think that in the Mobius problem, that's, that's already sort of available from about 2007. There's some nice mm -hmm. studies numerically of that. Uh, okay. Maybe to, to follow up, I, I can I can send you the details. Okay, sure. Maybe to follow up on uh, Ian's uh, point. Of course, this is just an intellectual exercise. But what about the uh, Klein bottle case? Oh. <laughs> okay, so, no, yeah, too so, much. So like the non, the non, the non, <laughs> just just for fun, just for fun. Like what what is the the conjectured uh, Sadovsky uh, version of that, for example? <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's a uh, well, uh, funny question, a nice question, but really, I, I don't know. It's really, and you are asking too much. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for fun. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, great talk. I was, I, I read a paper a year or so ago about like, it was trying to model super coiling of DNA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I, it took a very topological approach in terms of trying to find these equilibrium solutions in terms of uh, the rife and the excess twist uh, okay. in, in their model. I, and but they uh, they had to make some assumptions for you know it, it was a a round rod. You know, I, is there is there any limitations for using those sort of topological approaches for ribbons like this? Uh, I don't know how to how to say that. Uh, well, my point of view is really uh, about the variational approach. Right. So, um, as I was saying to to Ian, I wouldn't really know how to to include the naturally a topological constraint, mm. and so I, um, well, I don't know enough to to give you a, a reasonable answer. Um, I'm That's sorry. fair. Neither do I. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, though. Uh, Stephen, is that? Uh, did you put yeah, it back? Yeah. Up? If, I, if, I, if I could, I wanted to try and uh, draw in a discussion with Gilles uh, as well here, because he had kind of heavily weighed on this question of what's the right energy scaling, and so one of the things he talked about in his talk was. You know, if you sort of have the role of boundary condition enforcing, this kind of gets in the way of thinking about that. But in this purely topological world you're in, there is no boundary condition. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you and maybe if Jules, see, I notice he's still on the call, could have a little interaction. It'd be interesting to understand if in this case, with, with, with no boundary conditions required, because topology solves that for you, whether there's meaningful ways to, uh, to think about what's the correct scaling when you think of this um, low energy or you know, zero energy state or vacuum state. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, Gilles is available. Oh, I, I can't, I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just wondered if this was a good place to sort of ask that question and whether or not one could tease out what is the quote correct scaling in H or in W. You're not, you're not, you're not biting at this. <laughs> I'm biting. No, no. Okay. Well, I, 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 I tried. <laughs> you tried, yeah. Uh. So, Gilles, I'm sorry that I, well, I answered your question, but probably you weren't uh, online. No, but it was probably a stupid question, so it didn't matter. No, no, well, the answer was that I have uh, enough compactness to pass in the limit in the, in the product. So, if you want, I... Well, it was basically that the normals are converging strongly. So then... Yeah, the normals are converging strongly, and, and okay. then I have a second derivative which was converging okay. weakly. Thank you, Irene. It was just that. <laughs> yeah. This is a tag team QA session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, very nice. Thank you, Maria Giovanni. It was a beautiful Thank you. Thank, was you. A beautiful <laughs> Thank you. Thanks uh, for all of you. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming. We'll see you next week. Okay. <laughs>